I'm presenting my uh, dashboard project here. Uh, this was originally going to be well, it was originally going to be an hour talk, and then they gave me a 20 minute slot, so I turned it down, and then it's back to an hour. So I packed it up with some more stuff. So we'll see how this goes. Um, I'm going to start off with a. I, I gave this uh, presentation at the local prolongers group in Cincinnati, and people were actually more interested in the DeLorean than in the software. So I, I'm going to do a quick review of the the history of the DeLorean, just so everybody has you know some background on it. Um, all right, so here we go. Uh, I, ex I expanded it a little more at the last minute too. So the DeLorean story in 10 minutes. All right, so John DeLorean. Uh, he was uh, he was actually an engineer, like a pretty good engineer, according to the you know what other people say. Um, <clears throat> uh, he started off at uh, Chrysler, and uh, then GM uh, hired him off of Chrysler because he was doing really good work. Um, after a while in uh, GM, uh, they moved him into management, and it turned out he was pretty good at management too. Uh, they put him in charge of the Pontiac division. Uh, he's famous for creating the GTO, uh, which was kind of the, the first time that they ever stuck too large of an engine in the standard size car. And that, that's kind of started the whole muscle car era. Uh, so there you have John DeLorean in front of his GTO. Um, uh, the, the, he violated GM policy on allowed engine sizes, um, but it sold really well, so he got away with it. Um, yeah, like I said, he was, he was pretty good at management. He kind of went up the corporate ladder pretty quickly. Um, he also kind of turned, he kind of changed a bit and kind of, you know, started hanging out with movie stars and uh, Johnny Carson. And uh, eventually he worked his way all the way up to vice president of all car and truck manufacturing for GM. Uh, but his flash and glam lifestyle was kind of clashing with GM's conservative gray suit culture. And so then they kind of, he either quit or they forced him to exit or something like that. And he decided he was going to go start his own car company. So um, one, of his, one of his goals was you know, kind of Google-ish. It was, you know, he was going to make ethical cars. They were going to have more safety features. They were going to be cheaper to repair and last longer. Um, he decided, you know, his, his sports cars were kind of his thing. So he decided that the first car his company was going to produce was going to be the sports coupe. And he was going to pull in all of those cool ideas that he'd been coming up with over the years, some of which GM had shut him down on and not let him do. So it was going to have rear engine. It was going to have gullwing doors. It was going to have airbags. It was going to, he had all these like, different ideas for different engines that you could put in the thing. One of the ideas was a Wankel rotary engine. Other ideas that he had were uh, inline cylinders, where the cylinders are, you know, I, I guess airplanes use that idea, sort of. Uh, and then he had all these ideas for innovative manufacturing processes. Like he was, uh, he was going to build the whole thing out of like a fiberglass monobody. Um, anyway, so they uh, built the factory in North Ireland with the huge government uh, incentives. And he got that by playing Great Britain versus Puerto Rico to see who would, who would give him the best deal. Uh, the British government was trying to find uh, work for a large unemployed Irish population. So they were looking for you know, ways to entice businesses to... Uh, enter the area. Uh, so the problem, though, is you take a brand new company and a whole bunch of revolutionary new designs and a whole bunch of revolutionary new manufacturing processes and a workforce who's unfamiliar with cars, like some of them had never driven a car before. Um, and then you take the political instability of Northern Ireland, which right about then, you know, they uh, had Molotov cocktails being thrown over the fence and burned down their office. Not very, you know, uh, conducive to getting things done. And it re resulted in delays, budget overruns, and a quality control nightmare. So meanwhile, in the US, we had the fuel crisis going on. So everybody's more you know, conscious about you know, what kind of car they're buying. Um, <clears throat> new bumper height laws uh, you know, didn't go so well for sports cars. You had to raise them up quite a bit. Uh, new emission control laws, you had to put catalytic converters in the you know, oxygen sensor and the fuel, you know, dynamic fuel mixing and all that stuff. And since this was a brand new technology, it really sucked down the horsepower on you know, the existing systems. And the U.S. ran into recession. So he's paying for all these European you know, uh, labor and parts and then bringing it the wrong way across the exchange rate over to the U.S. So, the eight years later, they finally delivered the DMC-12. 
uh, using only about half of the innovative new ideas, and it was a bit heavier and, than planned and a bit uh, less powerful, and had to be priced closer to a Porsche than a Camaro. So the other, the other thing that went badly is that uh, all the people who were excited about this thing that was going to be so cool and priced about the price of a Camaro and then was suddenly the price of a Porsche were kind of you know, disappointed because they weren't going to get to get one. So <clears throat> a year and a half later, after the, uh, they started production, they were further in debt. Uh, they had some negative publicity going around. Uh, Johnny Carson got locked in his car. Um, <clears throat> and the sales were, you know, getting worse, uh, you know, slowing down. Uh, but uh, the engineering and pr production problems were mostly solved, uh, mostly. Um, <laughs> so then the, the final uh, nail in the coffin was an FBI informant who was a former drug dealer uh, trying to reduce his own sentence, approached DeLorean for a fake drug deal that could save the company, and DeLorean took the bait. So the legal case was easily, easily defended because it's a textbook case of entrapment. Uh, but it destroyed DeLorean's credibility. And then the British government foreclosed the company. So uh, after that, uh, Consolidated, which we know around here as Big Lots, uh, took over the company. They produced the 83 model, which was really just a bunch of 81 and 82 parts just assembled, you know, wherever they found enough parts to make a whole car. Um, not that there's anything wrong with the 83s. You just, you know, some of them have 81 hoods, and some of them have late 81 hoods, and some of them have 82 hoods, and so on. Uh, and then they sold off the assets. Um, all the remaining parts went to a company called K-Pac in Columbus, Ohio. So uh, then in 85, uh, Universal used the DeLorean in their you know, uh, cult classic movie. And then uh, enthusiasts started buying up the now relatively affordable DeLoreans and uh, started solving the remaining engineering problems. You know, so there's... <clears throat> You know, there, were, there were still a few things that you know, could cause your car to not start if it was hot on you know, three hours after you had been driving on a hot day. There were just some weird stuff like that. And so people finally traced down what this stuff was and got them, uh, most of the problems solved. Also some electrical grounding issues. And so then a decade later, uh, one of the Texas dealerships for the DeLorean uh, decided they were going to buy up all the remaining parts and they renamed themselves as the new DeLorean Motor Company. They started building new cars from the remaining original rolling chassis, which hadn't been finished by And so uh, because the VINs had already been allocated, they were able to use the 1980 uh, car regulations. So they can still produce the DeLorean without modern updates. So uh, many owners continue with DeLorean's spirit of innovation. Uh, there's a whole bunch of aftermarket uh, upgrades available. They have like door launchers. You know, you hit a remote button, your door is open. Um, and a, a whole bunch of, you know, Im further improvements on the original things. Um, and there's also a whole bunch of interesting custom creations that people have made. So there we have uh, a good, one of the best examples of a, a Back to the Future car replica. He's, he's gone a little overboard with the LEDs, I think, but um, it, 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 it looks unbelievable at night. Um, and you have uh, Ryan Brandis, who has a movie theater on the inside of his uh, hood. He has a button that like opens the hood, and then a Mac Mini on there, and you can start and, you know, a mouse in the center console, and you can start playing movies on it. Um, <laughs> probably not. Uh, the question is whether you can do that while driving. Uh, this is uh, Dave Delman's electric DeLorean. Those are um, lead-acid batteries in the front and rear, the big yellow ones. Uh, you have Nick Rodel's LS1, that's a Corvette engine DeLorean. A very, very large engine, goes very, very fast. Uh, he's also been featured on multiple TV shows, like uh, Car Fix did an episode on him recently. Uh, Rich Weissensel's uh, D-Brex. Uh, Rich W's DeLorean convertible, defeats the purpose a little bit, but it looks really nice. And Rich W's DeLorean limo. <laughs> There, there was a photoshopped limo, DeLorean limo going around. This is not the photoshopped one. This is the real one. Um, uh, oh, and, and uh, so, you know, part of the reason why I think people do this uh, to the DeLorean is because it, it, it's almost like it was never quite finished. It, it didn't have all the special features that John DeLorean wanted to put in it, and it, it, all, the engineering wasn't quite, you know, perfected, and so people feel like this is 
a cool you know thing to expand on. It was also supposed to be kind of the futuristic car, and so now it's kind of getting a little bit dated, being you know 35 years old, and <laughs> so you know people feel the need to do some updates uh, and some uh, the FAQ uh, things that you run into in car shows. Where's the flux capacitor uh, in Oliver's car? Um, those are aluminum, right? Uh, no, they are steel frame, a fiberglass tub that sits on top of it, and stainless steel, thin stainless steel panels on the outside. How's the gas mileage? Uh, mine gets about 27 miles per gallon. Uh, it has a V6. They, that, that was one of the things that they did because of the fuel crisis. They dropped from a V8 to a V6, which anybody paying that much for a car probably wouldn't care about the price of fuel, so I don't know. Um, can you still get, get parts? Yes, the Texas dealership, and there's also a bunch of people who just manufacture their own, you know, custom stuff, and then we kind of, you know, trade notes between each other and send each other designs and stuff. Um, I heard those aren't very reliable. Well, they weren't in 81, but they've pretty much fixed that since then. Where do you find one of these? Um, Maine. Uh, <laughs> Uh, but uh, more specifically, there's uh, 6,000 of them still on the road, and if you divide that by 50 states, or you know, 48, because there's probably not very many in Hawaii, then you end up with more than 100 per state. So they're around. All right. So that's what I've got on the DeLorean itself. So what I decided I needed to do. Oh, sure. The door prize. Uh, well, actually, at uh, every every uh, DeLorean car show that we've done up in, they, they do a DeLorean car show every two years where they have like the big gathering of DeLoreans and they have like 500 people and 200 DeLoreans and stuff like that. Uh, they actually do raffle off a DeLorean at every single one of those. Uh, the, the one in 2016 is going to be run by a different person, so there may or may not be a raffle car. Uh, he died in 2005, actually. But he, he actually was going to the DeLorean car shows for, you know, up until he died, so. How does a driver stay 88 miles per hour? <laughs> <laughs> oh, great. That's one of the FAQs. It's what happens at 88 miles an hour? And the answer is you get a speeding ticket. Um, <laughs> uh, it actually, it, it is actually a very um, comfortable car. Uh, you lay back in it, and it's almost like it's like driving around in a lawn chair. He doesn't yet. The limo is not actually. He he's come a long way on that project, but there's a long way yet to go. So, uh, like he had to custom fabricate a whole bunch of stainless panels to fit between the doors and. Uh, then he has more work to do on the interior, and then there's the problem of the turning radius. So, <laughs> all right. Uh, I would have if it were not 24 hours of driving from Cincinnati. Yeah, so if, if we move Gapsy closer to Cincinnati ex next year, it'll be there. Oh, yeah, I could do Baltimore. So you'll see it next year. All right, so uh, digital dashboard project. Um, here is the stock instrument cluster of the DeLorean. So you've got this like cool stainless steel, you know, awesome thing with the gullwing doors, and then you get in and you're looking at those, you know, like 1980s uh, galvanometer gauges. So you know, you turn on the power and the galvanometers go boing and point, you know. So it, it's, it's not very inspiring. If it, the the instrument cluster feels much less inspired than the rest. So there's another view of it. You can see it's got speedometer tack, you know, oil fuel pressure, stuff like that. So I don't know how well this shows up on camera, but anyway, so I decided that my goal was going to be to put a very large computer monitor in there. <clears throat> like that. That is one of my early prototypes. Uh, it's made with, um, you, you uh, go to Harbor Freight and buy the spot welder for like 200 bucks and then you get a bunch of galvanized steel wire and you get wire cutters and you just bend it and cut it and then pop it in the uh, spot welder and you can just make whatever you want to, as a wire frame. And you can see there I have a LCD monitor face down on the top and it's bouncing off of a mirror, which is why the image is backwards. So there's what happens when you take apart an LCD monitor. 
There's the Harbor Freight spot welder. Uh, there is the outside shape of the fiberglass. I just, I, uh, after mocking it up, I you know got down to the actual part of making it out of fiberglass, which is a whole lot of work and used up my garage for an entire year. Um, so there's the outside shape. There is me making a fiberglass cast of the actual dashboard, or the frame underneath of the dashboard. Uh, there is the uh, dashboard mat sitting on top of the dashboard, or on top of my mock-up. Um, there is the two of them all kind of sandwiched together as I try fiberglassing it all together. Uh, there's kind of the finished product uh, with the mirror holder in the back. And there it is with the monitor installed and the mirror holder installed and the monitor circuit boards on the back of the mirror. So, uh, the next problem. DeLorean was, the DeLorean was produced before the CAN bus or the ODBT, o, yeah, ODB connectors were invented. So CAN bus began in 83 and was officially released in 86. And ODB standardized, was standardized in 91, and then they didn't standardize the ODB2 until 94, and it wasn't in production cars until 96. So, analog schematics. <laughs> uh, yeah, I have, I have this printed out on two very large sheets of paper at home, and I consult it semi-regularly whenever I'm doing electrical work. And there is my 8-bit microcontroller. It's the AVR made by uh, Atmel. And it is, uh, on the bottom left there, you see the, the, those are the connectors that used to go into the back of the instrument cluster. I kind of, the, that's my early version of the uh, receiving end. I just epoxy puttied over the end of the connector and then pulled it apart and kind of drilled out holes, put in wires. And then the, the microcontroller is on a little proto board there that has the circuit on the back. And it's plugged into the power for the radio. That's all changed by now, but that was, that was my first attempt. So here is, now we're getting into to the actual programming part here. So um, I, I, this, this is back in like 2011. And so I decided that, you know, of course the right way to do this is to write it all in C. You want to, you know, have like, you know, fast, uh, snappy, responsive gauges and stuff like that. It's all gotta be like low level C and binary packets and, you know, shift that stuff around as fast as possible. So uh, the microcontroller is programmed in a kind of a mix of C and assembly. Um, I was sending USB human interface device packets, which was just a library that was kind of handy and I didn't have to do, you know, I, there, were, there were C libraries available on the receiving end, like libUSB. And then I had my microcontroller daemon, which uh, reads the packets and translates them, because microcontrollers don't do floating points so well, so <clears throat> all of the interesting math was done in the daemon. I wrote that in C++, and then it is sending uh, Unix datagrams, which also contain binary data, to the GUI, which was written in C++ as well. So my workflow was kind of that I would uh, hack on the microcontroller code, which uh, looks kind of like this. You know, nasty kind of uh, typecast everywhere because it's an 8-bit microcontroller and C, the, yeah, C changes, thing, changes the bit widths of everything uh, when you perform operations on it, so it requires a whole bunch of typecasting. And uh, then I would uh, change my structures that I was passing my data around in. They look kind of like this. Uh, notice the 24-bit integers that I'm storing the speed and the TAC uh, uh, timing things in. Because you only have 64 bytes in a USB packet. So I was trying to get as many you know, data points as I could in the space of the packet. So I ended up doing wonky stuff like 24-bit integers. Um, <clears throat> then I would go and change the processing code in the daemon. So there's the uh, thing that's reading the uh, uh, human interface device packets and then looking at the integer to see what kind of packet it is and then setting it to the correct size because not all of my packets needed to be 64 bytes, although they were all 64 bytes as they came over the USB bus. And, you know, a whole bunch of, you know, low-level fiddly stuff. Uh, and then I would recompile both and then I would reflash the microcontroller and then there would be bugs. And then I would update and recompile the utilities that would view my packets and they looked and he, here's some sample code of uh, my message utility library. So I would take one of my packets and I would like, you know, print out all of the fields in a human readable manner that I could try and figure out, you know, what was going wrong in the microcontroller and how to fix it. And then I would debug those too. <laughs> um, and then I would decide that I needed more information in the packets. And uh, repeat. So it, it was a very time consuming workflow. 
Oh, and uh, when I wanted to add a new widget to the GUI, I would sit down and I would write up a new class, like the tachometer gauge, and you know, the whole C++ boilerplate that you do for every single class. And then I would add resource IDs for the textures and the fonts that I was using. And I would load the resources at the startup of the program, and then I would construct the widget at startup, and uh, there you have an example of loading the, uh, the three fonts that I was using with the font IDs, you know, which were in an enumeration, and uh, setting the parameters for where the tech gauge was gonna appear on the screen, and then you know, set, you know, create the new tech gauge and stuff like that. And I would add the code to the main loop that renders the widget, and then I would start designing a, oh, and so it was all taking a lot of time, and so I started designing a smarter resource library, but gave up because it was, you know, I, I didn't have time to do it the better way. <clears throat> so, and yeah, and then I had to recompile any time the data packets changed, which, you know. Oh, and the other problem is that I had, uh, you know, so the GUI and then the microcontroller and then the daemon, and I had all three of them as separate projects, and so my make files were crossing back and forth between the three project directories, trying to keep the three of them in sync. And you know, then you go get check out a previous reversion, and then you've got to go recompile all three of them. Anyway, so this is kind of my estimated time breakdown. I didn't actually record, you know, time spent, but anyway, so I spent a decent amount of time on those stupid make files. And then um, <clears throat> the graphics that I was drawing by hand in GIMP, well, there's, that's kind of unavoidable. The graphics that I was doing in OpenGL, um, OpenGL is not super friendly to write a whole bunch of it by hand. And that was kind of what I was doing because I was just prototyping things. So I was spending a lot, you know, a decent amount of time on that. Uh, the program structure, you know, in C++, it's extra effort to go through and just structure, you know, I want to have these 15 widgets, so you've got to have a pointer for each one of them and kind of a, you know, manage the life cycle. Um, the binary packet support code, uh, you know, that just seemed like the right way at the time, but it was using up a lot of effort. Debugging the AVR. Uh, the stupid little microcontroller um, has no way to print messages other than, you know, what you've programmed into it. So I was trying to do all of my debugging over the USB human interface device packets. And you can't just say, generate a packet on this line, or you're in a tight loop and you're like, generate a packet, generate a packet. No, because the USB bus has a clock and you can only write so many packets per millisecond. Uh, so the debugging code that you write has to be very conservative about how much bandwidth it's using because the regular packets need that bandwidth or else you'll get stuttering. So that was kind of a mess. And then I got to, you know, the, the time spent debugging the GUI, uh, segmentation fault core dumps. Um, right, so let's find out where that happened. And then, you're, it, you know, it's a, a 60 hertz main loop. So as soon as you hit a breakpoint, you've just invalidated, you know, all the situations that you were trying to debug. So you pretty much, you have to very, very specific breakpoints that hit exactly when the, the, all the things went wrong at the same time. And then other, oh, other is uh, the, um, and just the business logic of the program that I actually wanted to write. So in 2013, uh, 2012 and 2013, I met this awesome girl and my free time dried up. So uh, it got to the point where I would come back to my project, you know, after a month of not looking at it, and I couldn't remember what was going on, what I was doing, you know, you know what was this for? Wasn't I gonna do that? Had I already done that? No. And it got to the point where I was actually making negative progress because I would say, all right, this is all wrong, this needs to change. I would start changing it, a month later, I would come back and I'm like, wait, what was I doing? And, and so I would actually have less done <laughs> each month than the previous. <laughs> so uh, about then, I decided that, hey, I'm doing all of this cool Perl stuff at work and getting so much stuff done so quickly, and it's so easy to document you know, what I'm doing at work, why don't I try doing that? So I converted my AVR to be a USB serial device. And so now I can write multiple debug statements that will just fill up the USB packet until it's full and then it ships off over the wire. And um, well, and then I still send off partial packets every now and then when, if I, uh, when, I, when I finish the um, calculations, I, I make sure that that packet goes out as soon as possible. But for, you know, for the debugging, it was 
a huge benefit because now I can just print strings. And all I have to do is use short strings and I can get a whole bunch of debugging messages per packet. Um, I converted my binary uh, packet to text lines. So it is, it is now like just plain old ASCII. I rewrote the daemon in Perl, which uh, before I was using libusb, and so I had to have two threads. Uh, you know, there's the thread talking to the clients and then the thread calling the blocking libusb call that reads a USB packet. So uh, by a, uh, not needing libusb, now I could do it all in one thread using uh, any event type, you know, event driven stuff. And then the GUI, I rewrote it in Perl with bits of inline C. And, and that was kind of the fun and interesting one because I was doing this low-level OpenGL stuff. And if you, if you just go straight to Perl's OpenGL library, it won't quite be fast enough, uh, well, because my, the, the computer I embedded in the car is only one gigahertz. So uh, there, were, you know, there, there were some real performance limitations there. Um, but the neat thing about inline C is that uh, you just you just ha you have a Perl module, and then you're just like, and here's the C code, and you just like write you know some C functions in there, and then you can make 50 OpenGL calls real in quick succession, and then it's a single you know Perl access you know exit and return. So <clears throat> for the back to the AV AVR debugging, um, the text is now or the you know the serial output is now text. Uh, combines the short packets so less USB bus, uh, bus congestion, and you can debug it with SoCat. I'm like, you know, SoCat, the you know uh, Dev DeLorean, is that on there? Yeah, open Dev DeLorean. Um, you can you can do fun things with uh, uh, UDEV rules. So, uh, and of course, writing the microcontroller, I can change the uh, micro, uh, USB IDs to be whatever I want. So I just set custom USB IDs, and then the uh, UDEV rules pick that up and change it to Dev DeLorean. And so yeah, I would just do SoCat Dev DeLorean standard IO and hit enter and I could just see what was coming over the wire. Um, and then any event, let me do the you know, thing in a single thread. Um, client server is painless because you know, the client server text protocols has been done so many times you can pick any Perl module you want to do that. Um, logging infrastructure, it, take your pick, plenty of Perl modules for that. Uh, oh yeah, and then uh, you know my scripts that you know I would come back to every month or so, and you know having not seen them for a while, I can add command line options now, like cake. So there is my microcontroller daemon, which now has usage information to remind me how to use it. Uh, I don't have to go digging through the C files trying to figure out what I was doing with my option parsing, um, and you get it for you know eleven lines of Perl. So. Uh, get up long is my friend, and pod to usage. So uh, back to the GUI. So uh, now I'm using JSON packets instead of binary packets. Uh, I decided to go you know a little more structured than just plain old text messages across. So I uh, <clears throat> have you know JSON packets flying over the wire. Um, the stream. Oh, this is a great thing. When I was using datagrams, it would require a syscall for every message. And sometimes the microcontroller would maybe generate 20 messages in the space of you know, one single 60 hertz uh, loop of the main program, which would mean I was making like 20 syscalls. Well, now if they're in a stream, you can actually pull in all of the messages in a single read call and then iterate through them on your own time. So the, you know, while, while it's Perl now, it actually, you know, there was a speed trade-off there. So I'm you know, using an interpreted language to do the reading but now I'm using fewer syscalls, so performance is about identical. And then the stream allows reading multiple packets. And yeah, the uh, it's easier to debug because of log any carp always. Oh yeah, carp always. You want you want to know what the problem is in the middle of your you know 60 hertz you know loop that's digging down into anonymous subroutines and all that stuff. You just carp always, and you're like, okay, that's what happened. That happened. That happened. Oh, there we go. Bug fixed. And it's uh, much easier to write libraries, I think, in uh, Perl than in C, especially when you're you know, crossing between projects because you don't have to recompile them. Um, the resource manager. I finished writing the library in half the time that I spent not getting it done in C++. <laughs> so there's, there's a quick example. I say use OpenGL min res res, and then my res is my, uh, you know, 
singleton instance of the resource manager, and I can grab an image out of that by name, which is the file name, no more stupid you know, numeric enumeration IDs, and then I bind it into the OpenGL context, and then I just start doing OpenGL on the current texture. So, yeah, my resource library, um, actually, oh, one of the other things that the resource library does, it, I have all of the images stored on disk uncompressed in the format that OpenGL loads them. So I memory map the image and then pass it to the OpenGL load texture call, at which map memory maps it into the driver, and there was no copying of that data ever. Uh, the other cool thing, the fonts. You, uh, in, OpenGL doesn't have any font support. Um, you pretty much, there's this really awesome library called FTGL, which is the free type library bound to OpenGL. And so uh, FTGL will take a font in memory, which, you know, font files can be big, like 24 meg, you know, stuff like that. Well, it only, a font file has a kind of an index built in. So if you memory map the font file, it'll be able to jump straight to the glyphs and only load the pages that it needs. And then the FTGL library will render uh, the font as a given size into OpenGL textures. So what I was able to do is have uh, fonts rendered at different resolutions um, that share the same font memory map. And because it's Perl, I'm able to use the reference counting to just handle all of the you know, complexities of that for me. Where in C, you would kind of have to be aware of you know, which font rendering is using which font memory map and, you know, which, you know. So anyway, I was, I was able to write the library the right way. And so now the, the, the startup time of the program is actually shorter than it was with the C++ version because it's, now it's written the correct way. It just memory maps the minimal bits it needs and starts right up. So now here's my new time breakdown. If I wanted to, yeah, the question is, could I see my speed in Comic Sans? And yes, I can pick any font I want, and then it'll, you know, <clears throat> I can do monospace, you know, uh, dynamic uh, spacing and everything. So here's my new time breakdown. So notice the make, I, I do still have a make file because I want to uh, generate all of my textures from the image files, uh, but the make file is now much less complicated. It doesn't have to cross project directories or anything. Uh, the GIMP graphics are the same as they were before. Uh, I still have to sit down and draw stuff. Uh, the OpenGL graphics. I wrote a little OpenGL sugar library that gives me all of the OpenGL commands that kind of, you know, quick four-letter abbreviations. And so I can sit down and I can write a new widget in about an hour. And once I've got it written, then I go back and I uh, replace some of the sugar methods with actual OpenGL calls to speed it up a little bit. But you know, having those sugar methods available really speeds up my development of uh, OpenGL graphics. So the program structure is now you know cake. I just throw things into a hash, and go back and walk the hash later in you know each of my main loop iterations. Uh, the JSON packet support code, <laughs> you just use whatever Perl has already given you. That's almost you know, non-existent. So. Um, then debugging the AVR got easier because you know everything's text. I can just SOCAT to see what I'm doing. Uh, debugging the GUI is cake because I can see you know stack traces and you know what's going wrong, and I can just print stuff to the logging system to see how that's going. And other, I now have a whole lot more time to throw in new features. So in the last two months, I've added GPS support, and it sets my system clock from the satellite time. <clears throat> um, so uh, speed. Perl is slower than C++, but not if Perl lets you write a better design. And then the, so there's the startup time actually re was reduced because the resource you know, library is more efficient. Uh, and if you need to speed boost, you just start moving stuff into inline C. Uh, another thing I think I forgot to put on the slides. Oh yeah, there we go. Um, so you can also convert OpenGL sugar to lo the low level calls when you need to. And OpenGL has this thing called display lists where you, you make a bunch of OpenGL calls and they're getting translated into whatever language the you know, hardware is interested in. You can say begin list, make a bunch of OpenGL calls and say end list, and now it will save that already you know, it translated to how the hardware wants to see it. And so you can, make, you can now make a single OpenGL call that reruns all of those commands. And uh, I have a nice sugar method for making OpenGL display lists. You just wrap it in a code ref, and anything that happens in that code ref gets captured, and 
So it makes it really easy to um, optimize with display lists, which would have actually been harder in C++. Uh, oh, and you can use lighter weight Perl modules. So, you know, <clears throat> I'm using Moo and not Moose. I'm not using certain other modules. Date time. Um, and I have a really fast startup. So, on to the demos. Here is the system booting up. That's my custom instrument cluster, now that it's been all sanded and painted and everything. There's the Fit PC located under there, which you cannot actually see at all on this. Uh, need some gamma correction, sorry about that. And there's the Fit PC lighting up. The little blinking light is a microcontroller. The display is backwards because it's bouncing off a mirror. But OpenGL lets, lets you fix that with a single negative sign. Xorg takes a bit to load still. And there we go. Shining down on the mirror. Uh, there's my, oh, we already missed it. Um, the GPS just got its fix, so it turned green. Uh, the blinking light is my parking brake. Oh, no, th there it goes. GPS got its fix now. So it has the coordinates. Uh, soon there will be mapping, but that's hard, so that'll take a while. <clears throat> Next one. Then I had to bring it out of the garage so I could do a video of starting it up. So I'm turning the key. There's voltage. The sensors start working, and then I crank it. There's oil pressure, there's tachometer. And then I'm gonna rev it here in a second. That's the natural hunting that the engine does because it has the, brand, or the first generation uh, uh, fuel injection system in it. <laughs> oh yeah, the DeLorean is fuel injection, by the way. That was one of the features they did make it in. <clears throat> And those, uh, the, the little yellow tick marks are what speed you would be going in each of the five gears at that RPM. <laughs> <clears throat> oh, and uh, you, well, anyway, so I'm uh, about to, uh, that, that's the real car. And then I have the program, the, you know, being a uh, Perl script, it's pretty easy to make it run just about anywhere. So it'll run here on my laptop. getting clipped off a little. It expects a wide, uh, wide aspect ratio. <laughs> yep. <clears throat> and you can see my, you know, you, you can do some really fancy stuff with OpenGL, you know, fading in and out. You're just changing the alpha blends uh, for the color. And yes, I can make that whatever font I want. You know, I, in fact, I could almost do that quick enough to do it here on the demo. Um, Anyway. Oh, and in the lower right, you can almost not see it, but I have the clock, which has seconds and milliseconds with those <laughs> spinning rings. Um, yeah, when you turn on, you know, you, you normally have like, the, he was asking about the, uh, the uh, light indicator. So you normally have like the green and yellow light that I mean, green and blue light that indicate whether your lights or your brights are on, so. Um, so right now, my, my wheel sensor is actually, oh, okay, so backing up a little bit. One of the classic engineering problems of the DeLorean is that they, uh, since it's a rear engine car, they decided to put the speedometer on the front left wheel. So there, there is actually, there's like this little rod that goes through the axle of the front left wheel 
has a gearbox on the inside that goes to a flex cable that goes up through the firewall into, which it isn't really a firewall because the engine's in the back, anyway, uh, comes up through the uh, interior of the car through a service counter, which tells you when to change your oxygen sensor, and then up into the back of the instrument cluster. And with that long snaking cable in the gearbox and, you know, humidity changes that get, you know, frost inside of there, um, Pretty much every DeLorean that has ever been manufactured has had that gearbox strip out. So when mine, when mine stripped out a few years ago, I was like, all right, I'm done with this thing. Uh, and I replaced it with a sensor that I made using uh, magnets and a hull sensor, a hull effect sensor. Uh, so I am actually uh, getting digital pulses uh, every time the wheel turns, and I can change that to be however many pulses per revolution I want so I can get you know, more precision or less precision. Uh, at the moment, my wheel sensor is broken, but I am working on version two, and I'm 3D printing it. So it's, it's kind of a tight space inside of the front wheel, and the, the problem was that as I would put the front wheel onto the car, I would bang the sensor, and then it would knock it away from the magnets, and then it wouldn't pick up anything. So slightly. Well, it's it's an accurate it's an accurate measure of how far the front left wheel traveled. So, <clears throat> all right, the legal requirements of the speedometer and, uh, and odometer. All right, uh, it, this is a little bit of a gray area, but it's, it's illegal to misrepresent the number of miles on your car. My car was already at 100,000 miles. I'm like, whatever, and I'm probably not going to sell it anyway. So I am, I am no longer claiming any miles on my car at all. So... <clears throat> um, Aside from that, I can actually use these tick marks in the meantime to see how fast I'm going. <laughs> oh, no. No, no, actually, the, the, the airbag was one of the features that they uh, didn't get into the production car. So... No, so, so there are no DeLoreans with airbags, but there was a prototype DeLorean that had an airbag, and they actually did some testing with it and then decided that it wasn't going to be reliable enough or something, and then they scrapped that and um, put in kind of an... Actually, but the actual... Uh, this, this is an aftermarket steering wheel that I have in there. Uh, the actual uh, DeLorean steering wheel does have kind of a big pocket in the center of it. So it was... It was All right, so the question is safety of all that stuff in front of me. So the, the computer is pretty well secured. I have it bolted to the bottom of the dashboard. It's not going to come off. Um, the instrument cluster itself, uh, I actually invented, you know, <clears throat> brackets that would fasten down to the, you know, same things as the original uh, instrument cluster. And the steering wheel is in front of you, so, you know, the instrument cluster can't really come back and hit you because it would run into the steering wheel first. And that would only be if you were rear-ended, because you know, if you're in a crash, you go, you go forward. So you would hit the steering wheel, and you'd hopefully your seatbelt would stop you. Uh, the Fit PC, it's um, about this big. Um, it, that's, uh, let me see, I could actually pull up, well. I'm not on the internet right now. Anyway, uh, FitPC has a website. You can go look at them. They're about, I don't know, an inch thick. Uh, so they're pretty light, and then they have a low-power version, which I got just because I didn't want to drain my battery too badly. Uh, so it's drawing something like 6 watts. Um, it gets a little hot on hot days. I'm going to probably have to put a fan in there. But the, the, P, the FitPC itself is fanless. The question is where uh, further uh, <clears throat> where am I going to take the design? Is it going to look like the movie car and stuff like that? Uh, no, mine is actually going to be the Knight Rider DeLorean. <laughs> it, it, it's going to get there eventually. I, I was actually going to go for the speech recognition and whole, all that stuff first, but then since I'm putting a computer in the car anyway, I got kind of distracted on this dashboard thing, and that's become my main focus for the last few years. 
Um, where, the question is, where's the code? Right now, most of it is not on CPAN. I am planning to polish up some of my libraries and put them on CPAN. Um, right now, it, one of the problems with you know linking with OpenGL and stuff like that and free type and stuff is that you have to worry about the library paths, and so I haven't, I haven't done the work to make the module uh, likely to install on anyone else's system. That's, that's one of the other things about the project is that I have a custom Linux that is uh, Gentoo with a Perl script that goes through and pulls out the binaries that I'm interested in and the support files that I'm interested in and completely custom startup code. So there are no, there are no init scripts on my system uh, that's in the car. And also it is using a read-only file system for just about everything and it's using uh, tempfs for all of the log files and stuff like that. And then I have a uh, persistent partition where I, you know, when I get around to having data that I want to persist from run to run, I will have a script that very conservatively copies stuff over to that partition because I, I don't want to continually write to my you know, flash drive or you know, one. You know, I, I have it kind of set up to where this could lose power at any moment and it, nothing happens, you know, it, because it was a read-only file system. And so I am, I'm trying to keep it to where it can lose power at any moment and never have a problem, because I don't want to have to go extract the whole thing, pull out the drive, stick it in a different machine, and you know, all of that jazz. So Question is, do, uh, what do I have my OS on? It's actually a, a solid state disk, um, 80 gig, I think. Um, so the, the Fit PC takes the laptop-sized hard drives. So you can put whatever hard drive you want in there. I just picked a solid state disk so it would boot up faster. Uh, the, the little Question is, do I have any other ideas for visualizations? Um, yes, I have many, many ideas. I just... Uh, <clears throat> it's all about you know finding time to work on them, but he, I'll give you a preview of this one. So when I get this done, the DeLorean sits really low, like it, it's the whole car is only about you know four feet tall. Um, the rear view mirror in the middle of the car, in the middle of the windshield, takes up an awful lot of your field of view. And so one of the projects that I was actually put in, put in a lot of work and then decided I wanted to do some other things first is to put a camera on the back of the car that will be the rear view mirror. And the, gash, the uh, dash gauges will be transparently rendered on top of it. And also when I get the mapping done, all of these dash gauges will be able to, um, yeah, I can't see my mouse, and that's on purpose because I don't want to see the mouse pointer in the car. Um, <laughs> Anyway, uh, when I get this done, all of those dash gauges will kind of shrink to the lower right corner uh, while you're viewing the map. And then they'll you know, zoom back to full size while you're driving. So, uh, you know, with OpenGL, everything's, you know, just coordinate space and you can scale it and twist it and rotate it however you want. And so I, I have lots of capabilities, you know, available, lots of options. Also, notice the little uh, yellow exclamation points on all of the gauges. That's because it does, I, uh, I just ran the uh, instrument cluster directly without running the fake data server. Uh, that was my gauge animator, by the way, which is also a Perl script that was only a few lines of code. Um, it just sits there and runs all of the you know, data points through a uh, range of values. So right now the data server isn't running, and you get these little yellow exclamation points, which is kind of neat because when you have it in the car and the con you know, connector comes unplugged or one of the wires isn't soldered very well, you get a null value and then it shows up as an exclamation point on the dashboard. The question is, so with OpenGL I could go 3D? Yes, I could. I just have not yet found a reason to go 3D. <laughs> <laughs> um, but, but, but the other you know, interesting idea, and one that I'm uh, probably gonna get to, is I'm gonna put more cameras on the car eventually uh, than just the rear view mirror. And so when I'm at a stoplight and I hit the left turn signal, I'm gonna like fire up the camera that's on the front left bumper so that I can see around corners. And when I get to doing that, I might start using 3D effects to rotate the images into view. So that, that might be a thing you see next year. No, I haven't actually. 
Uh, some of the earlier versions, the microcontroller would crash, but then it would reset itself because it, it doesn't have it doesn't have anywhere to go when it crashes, so it just starts the program over from the top. So, <laughs> anyone else? Let's see. Actually, I did have just a few last slides, but. So my conclusion is that Perl is fast enough. It, it doesn't need to be, you know, ultimately fast. You know, like writing everything in C++. You just have to have the most important parts written in C++, and then Perl can take care of all of that glue that holds everything together that is kind of painful to write in C++ uh, when used carefully. Uh, so I get a full 60 frames per second on a one gigahertz embedded processor. Uh, the software in my project is now taking less time than uh, developing the software in my project is now taking less time than developing the hardware. Uh, but my 3D printer is helping with that. So there's a mock-up of the connector that goes into the instrument, back of the instrument cluster. Uh, there's a whole bunch more details on my website, um, which is only about half complete, but you know I'm getting pages, more pages up every now and then. So nerdvana.net. Um, it's got a whole bunch of cool stuff on it. All right. Oh, one more. The question is, am I sharing it with other DeLorean owners? Um, yes, but it, it kind of needs packaged first. And you know, packaging a project is actually surprisingly difficult. Also, uh, replic like right now, you know, if somebody asked me, oh hey, can you make a copy for me? It would, it would, I would have to charge them like $10,000 because of all the time it would take me to go make another copy of the fiberglass instrument cluster, buy a $400 fit PC, you know, do the custom circuitry work on the, you know, print, you know, 3D print work connectors, put the, you know, contacts inside of them, solder it all together, find another, you know, metal housing to hold the circuit board. Um, you know, so, uh, in order to bring it down to a cost that people would actually be willing to pay, I'm going to have to uh, actually fabricate my own circuit board, like, you know, actually design it out to where I can just take surface mount components, drop them on there, put it in an oven, and, you know. But, of course, all of that requires effort, so. How much time do we have? All right. All right, so anyways. Thank you.